Gresham College presents Debussy, Text and Ideas, Performing the Ineffable, Text, Gesture and Performance in Debussy's Trois Poèmes de Stéphane Malamé. Good morning, everyone. I'm Catherine Bergeron, and I'm the chair, uh, the happy chair of this next session. I'd like to welcome you to From Text to Performance. So after that lovely recital that many of us were able to hear yesterday afternoon, I think this session seems like a natural continuation. In fact, you'll hear more about some of the texts that inspired the settings that were performed yesterday. All three of the speakers this morning are going to be exploring the question of poetic expression through the lens of performance in one way or another, thinking perhaps about the characteristic gestures of performance or what makes a poem singable or even the specific historical situation of performers and audiences. Um, so our first speaker this morning is Joseph Aquisto. He's a professor uh, of French studies from the University of Vermont and a specialist in late 19th and early 20th century uh, French literature. He's written a very thoughtful book on symbolist poetry and the idea of music, he, another book on the Robinson Crusoe myth in French literature, and, uh, and he's currently at work on a book about Baudelaire and pessimism. In his talk today, he returns to the subject from his first book, uh, The Poetry of Mallarmé, and his title is Performing the Ineffable, Text, Gesture, and Performance in the Trois Poèmes de Stéphane Mallarmé. Joseph. Good morning. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, there's a handout on your chairs with a few quotations that I'll be referring to uh, during the talk and their English translations. Uh, on the second page of the handout, you'll find the, the full text of the poem I'll be discussing, and following that, uh, the, f the full score of the short song I'll be talking about, which is the, the third of Debussy's Trois Poèmes de Stéphane Mallarmé. Um, we heard a wonderful performance of this song last night. Um, because of that, and perhaps because Malame would have preferred us not to actually hear any music, uh, I will not be playing any excerpts from the, the song, but I will be referring to specific moments in the piece, and, and the score is, is there for you. Debussy's Trois Poèmes de Stéphane Malame from 1913 are his last group of song settings of texts written by others. One critic describes them as, quote, a series of philosophical vignettes where the roles of poet and musician are not merely merged, but virtually exchanged, end quote. This formulation suggests that in these songs, Debussy goes beyond the song composer's role as simple reader of the text in order to recompose the very poem itself, or alternatively, to present the music as a text to be read. One possible consequence of seeing that music as a text would be a too facile focus on communication through music, which all too often has resulted in Debussy's works being read in terms of musical representations of various scenes, moods, and effects. Rather than seeking to communicate or translate the particular poetic text at hand, though, these settings complicate the notion of musical and literary communication by inviting us to ask larger questions about the relation of text to music and how each reinterprets the other in a song setting. Little unites the three poems Debussy chose to form this set, which are Soupir, Place Futile, and Éventail, save the, direct form, the form of direct address to a tu, a familiar you, which structures each of them. It is interesting that Debussy chose not those Malamé poems with a surfeit of images, quote unquote, to which one could apply word painting techniques, but rather poems that feature, at least to some extent, the complicated syntax and abstract style for which Mallarmé's later work is known. Much of what is communicated to the listener could be said to belong to the ineffable. And indeed, except for very brief moments, the entirety of the song set is marked at a piano dynamic or even softer. To begin to examine questions of communication and the ineffable in Debussy, it is useful to turn to the philosophically inflected music criticism of Vladimir Jankilevich. Concerning the question of musical dialogue, Jean Kilevich notes that in the case of the late Debussy, to see the piano and vocal lines as a unity which contains overlapping systems of meaning. In this way, music and text will not stand opposed to each other, but rather in complex relation of occasional tension and occasional overlap. <laughs> 
Peter Kivey's recent work on the philosophy of literature emphasizes the act of reading as a silent performance. He situates poetry as, I'm quoting Kivey, a kind of halfway house between out front performed literature and private silent read literature of which the modern novel is the prime exemplar." End quote. Now a song setting on this view does not impose a particular reading on a poem, but rather, in Kivey's words, dramatizes solitary silent reading, end quote, rendering explicit in sound what is already implicit in the act of reading itself. If, a, if song renders the reading process audible, in the case of Mallarmé's poems, the question becomes one of how to do full justice to the complexity of a reading process that involves movement both forward and back in order to reconstitute syntax. That's typically how one is said to need to read a Mallarmé poem to go backwards in order to move forward to understand what he might be saying. And to be open to the pluralities of meanings present in the poem. Another layer of complexity appears when such a poem is set to music since a whole other set of overlapping meanings is now added, encouraging the listener to identify the play of what Elizabeth McCombie has called shared structural rhythms between the music and the text. One begins to have the impression that the work of art in its totality will always escape us, allowing us to focus on one or two or maybe more of its elements at once, but never allowing a single hearing to make present and perceivable to us all that is happening. The risk, of course, is that the musical setting will reduce the complexity of the text, in the case of something like Mallarmé's text, by absorbing it into the musical texture. Macambi has drawn attention to the differences between the experience of reading Mallarmé on his own and reading him as what she calls stage managed by Debussy, noting, for instance, the difference in their treatment of silences, which she calls angular and blank in Mallarmé, but often translated into what she calls infinitely supple music in Debussy. In order for the complexity of the text not to be lost in or subsumed by the music, we need to see the song on its own terms as a work even more complex than the poem. When making sense of the songs, we are unable to fall back on simple expression of ideas in terms of word painting, since Debussy's settings go beyond mere conventional musical reflection of the images presented by the text, and even seem at times to work against the structure of the poem. Jean Kilevich underscores the importance of silence for Debussy and links it to the emergence of music from words. In his study of music in the ineffable, uh, Jean Kilevich writes that, this is quote number one on the handout, la musique est le silence des paroles, tout comme la poésie est le silence de la prose. The song setting thus represents a removal from the chaotic sound of daily life and the banal prose usage of words into a space where a deeper act of listening is required one whose silence makes space for the listener. In this realm, silence and a certain kind of sound can coexist. This is quote number two. Le silence n'est pas seulement avant et après, il est aussi pendant, au centre et au cœur même de la musique. Jean Kilevich thus comes to associate silence with a sound that evokes full presence, and he finds this resonant silence most powerfully expressed in Debussy. This total presence hovers at the threshold of nothingness, a fragility underscored by its barely audible sounds. This is quote number three. Debussy retient l'être sur le bord aigu du non-être. Aussi peut-on appeler ce moindre être, Debussyiste, un presque rien. Mais entre le néant et lui, il y a justement la différence de ce presque, qui est une différence infinie. Les éléments dont nous entretient la musique de Debussy sont les créatures les plus inconsistantes de la création. L'air, le satin frissonnant qui, comme l'éventail de Malarmé, agite du bat battement de son aile les parfums et les désirs. Now here we return to Malarmé's world, the volume of poetry whose first words, rien, cet écume, nothing, this foam, set the stage for fragile hovering between presence and nothingness. Malarmé's poetry is not so much expressive as creative by virtue of the invitation it offers to the reader to enter into the world of layered interpretations. This plurality of interpretive possibilities also chimes with Jean Kilevich's observations on musical expressivity in Debussy, an argument against an impressionist Debussy who would paint pictures for the listener. This is quote number four. La musique est donc inexpressive, non pas parce qu'elle n'exprime rien, mais parce qu'elle n'exprime pas tel ou tel paysage privilégié, à l'exclusion de tous les autres. La musique est inexpressive en ceci qu'elle implique d'innombrables possibilités d'interprétation. » 
C'est possible se compénètre au lieu de centre en prêcher, comme centre en pêche dans l'espace, les corps impénétrables localisés chacun en son lieu propre. Here we have a model for an analysis of the way music and text function together in trois poèmes. So in my remaining time today, I will analyze the way gesture and communication function in the last song of the set. Mallarmé's poem Au Tréventail de Mademoiselle Mallarmé, uh, another fan of Mademoiselle Mallarmé, his daughter, whose setting Debussy entitled simply Éventail, fan. Mallarmé's poem imagines the speech, so, so to speak, of his daughter's fan as it invites her to take it in his hand, reflects on the motion she induces by waving it in the air, and then comes to rest again. The situational aspect of the poem has led some critics to place it among Mallarmé's lighter verse, the celebration of the quotidian in the Veil de Circonstances, a simple poem of a, of a moment of daily life, while critics such as Jean-Pierre Richard provide a metaphysically inflected reading, focusing on the transposition of the movement of the fan into the poem's final image of le feu d'un bracelet, the fire of a bracelet, which recalls, along with figures such as mon aile, my wing, or the blanc vol, the blank or white flight, a network of images often used by Mallarmé in his most sophisticated poems. Now, focus on gesture gets us beyond this tension between the two approaches. This gestural movement is, however, of a particular kind. It is goalless and does not progress from one place to another. Rather, it is contained by the single gesture of the young woman's hand, allowing the movement to emerge with the word vertige in the third of the five stanzas, and then falling once more into stillness. This arc mirrors the movement of language in the poem, from the silence of the white space before it begins to the silence to which it returns at the end. The curious hesitation between movement and stagnation figures in that central stanza of the poem, where the comparison that evokes the movement also suggests a relation from person to person, and an erotic one at that. Vertige, voici que frissonne l'espace comme un grand baiser, qui, fou de naître pour personne, ne peut jaillir ni s'apaiser. Here, Mallarmé invites reflection on the goallessness of both the fan's movement and the kiss that exists only virtually or in eternal suspension. The lateral movement of the fan is not a linear progression, but rather a gesture that emerges from stillness in order to rejoin it, transformed by the end of the poem into the fan's stillness, as seen in the light of the sparkle of the bracelet's gem. The poem's phonetic structure emphasizes the dichotomy between stillness and movement by exploiting a tension between voiced and unvoiced consonants, the former becoming strongly associated with movement by the exclamation vertige, ex exaggerating so you can hear those consonants, and later in the same stanza, the verb jaillir, that's line 12. That same stanza emphasizes the voiced-unvoiced dichotomy by the sounds in rhymes, which oppose an unvoiced, unvoiced s, s to its voiced equivalent Z, Z, in the rhyme words. And I've tried to illustrate that in, um, in, the, in quote number six. It's not a quote really, but uh, an illustration of the rhyme words. Frissonne, baiser, personne, s'apaiser. With that last infinitive, including both the S and the Z, just as the word as it is used here suggests both movement by its association with jaillir and stillness by its semantic association with tranquility. By the end of the poem, the S sound associated with stillness comes to dominate in such lines as stagnant sur les soirs d'or, soleil. And in a rhyme, soleil and bracelet, which according to one commentator, and I quote that, seems to freeze the poem in light, unquote, thus bringing to an end the tension that was still in play in this last stanza. The poem thus consumes itself and leads itself back to the silence from which it emerged. And in that sense, it replicates the gesture it describes, from stillness to movement and back. By allowing the poem to perform the gesture it describes, Mallarmé sets up an implicit parallel between two kinds of direct address. In the poem, the fan speaks to the young woman. And this ventriloquizing emphasizes that the poet is in a way addressing himself to us, his readers, allowing us to bring the poem out of silence into voiced words and back. The poem's adoption of direct address as its conceit 
highlights the performative aspect of poetry and the way in which each poem needs to be completed by the act of reading, without which the poem remains blanc, uh, from line 19, as in both blank and white, effectively erased by the lack of interpretive act that would bring a poem into its full creation. There would be no transformation of the words on the page into a meaningful text if the poem were to remain without a reader, as the, that kiss remains without another person to receive it. While it is possible to read some sort of transfiguration into light at the end of the poem, it is far from certain that such a transformation actually takes place. And one's interpretive decision about this question will determine whether one sees this more as a poem of everyday reality or a metaphysical reflection. As I've already suggested, concentrating on the idea of gesture provides a way around this interpretive dilemma by focusing on the movement itself as it lies at the heart of the poem and then disappears into stillness. The poem thus becomes about gesture and direct address more than progression. And this is one key feature that makes the poem such a rich choice for the late Debussy. While such theoretical reflections probably did not play a role in determining, in, uh, a determining role in Debussy's choice of poem, his reasons for choosing these poems are not known, but given that the songs were dedicated to Madame's daughter, it is more than likely that he chose this poem because of its explicit link to her. The poem does offer a strong parallel to Debussy's rethinking of harmonic progression in his later periods. The late Debussy is, like the Malamé of Autre Ventaille, looking to craft a poetics from lack of progression. And as we shall see, he too relies heavily on gesture in order to create that new compositional approach. Elizabeth McCombie analyzes the song in terms of its gestures and events. I'll quote her. Rhythmically, sounds never arrive in any predictable pattern. Each one is a shock, a reference to something we have missed or to an event that never took place. Each interjection seems to be lingering at the edge of silence, the messenger of something that is not happening." End quote. Macombe here echoes Jean Kielewicz's comments on Debussy's poignant silences. If Jean Kielewicz is right that music is the silence of words and poetry the silence of prose, then both silences come together in Eventail to create a third space, a gestural space that must be completed by the participation of the hearer. This bilateral interpretation of the song as both near silence and at the same time full of potential meaning echoes the position of the poem itself between the evocation of a quotidian object, the fan, and the larger metaphysical potential inherent in that object. Debussy's concentration on musical gesture merges with Mallarmé's poetic exploration of directionless movement in order to get beyond the idea of progression in favor of models of artistic expression that invite readers or listeners to establish coherent experience from the sounds and words of the song without traditional guideposts such as strophic form or harmonic prolongation and tonal resolution to guide them. From the start, the song cancels the typical structure of vocal melody with piano accompaniment by presenting rather a series of gestures in both the vocal line and piano. A light cascade of notes with punctuating inverted seventh chords forms the introduction before the vocal entrance at which point piano and voice rather than sounding simultaneously, alternate gestures. The vocal line, a chromatic melody of very narrow range, divides the first line of poetry into two short gestures separated by a rest, while the piano is reduced to brief punctuating figures. The halting, clipped nature of the vocal line emphasizes its own gestural rather than melodic quality, creating an effect of echo gestures between piano and voice. The song proceeds by several processes of subtraction, if you will, complementing the, the poem's subject matter of a fleeting movement in the air by a set of techniques that involve presenting a minimum of musical material, enough to identify continuity with the melodie tradition and then making that material recede. In other words, Debussy works uh, with musical suggestion in this song in a way entirely different from the usual notion of musical suggestion as evocation of mood or impressionist scene painting. Here, suggestion works at a higher level of abstraction, as Debussy hints at many of the parameters of common practice period music without carrying them through in canonical ways by any means. A fairly, metrical, a fairly regular metric structure in 2-4 is established by the first measures, but this is immediately subverted by a change to 3-4 in measure 7 before the return to 2-4 for the remainder of the song. 
The 2-4 meter does not, however, present a strongly established sense of pulse, due in part to eight changes of tempo in the 65 measures of the song, with a gradual rallentando over the last 15 measures. This interplay of regularity and irregularity is echoed in the tonal structure of the piece, which abandons common tonal harmonic development, but retains, at a larger structural level, a kind of progression of tone centers, beginning with the prominent F sharps in the bass, that's measures four to seven, culminating in the sustained high F sharp in the vocal line at the conclusion of the setting of the first stanza, that's measure 12. Then there is a shift to F natural as an important center, beginning in measure 37, which corresponds to the setting of the fourth stanza. This tone center is less firmly established than the F sharp had been, and serves as a transitional moment before the song comes to rest in the setting of the final stanza on a tonal center of E, prepared by a series of B naturals in the vocal line, that's measures 51 to 58, before the final chanted E natural in the setting of the final line, presented conjointly with the piano sounding that same E, that same e natural in unison. Now, if there's any tonal progression, so to speak, um, to speak of in the song, it is a simple descent from F sharp to E via passing F natural. These tonal centers are not supported by conventional functional harmony, however, and are not immediately apparent when listening to the song, and that's, that's the important point here, I think. Debussy thus subtracts all of the elements of harmonic progression except single tones, which take on momentary structural importance, but without a harmonic stream of harmonic framework to reinforce it. Debussy's processes of sub subtraction and suggestion result in a work in which presence and absence coexist. While the gradual movement from F sharp to E is undeniably present structurally, the weak reinforcement and the proliferation of other musical gestures make it difficult to perceive that movement as one is actually listening to the piece. This creates a dichotomy between the compositional structure and the way in which the piece is perceived by listeners, who are in inevitably drawn to the larger and louder gestures that punctuate the piece, most notably the furiously paced two measures of wide-ranging piano figure and descending octave leap on the word vertige, measures 25 and 26, the loudest two measures of the work at a mezzo forte, and the highest note in its vocal range. The simultaneous presence and absence and the resultant variation between the song as it appears when analyzed on the page and when it is heard in performance are also reinforced by important notes in the piano which are present on the page but which are not audible in performance. These are, significantly, the bass notes accompanying the setting of the first and last words of the text, that is, the very notes that establish F sharp and E as important tone centers. If you look at measure five and six, the F sharp in the bass is a, is a half note, or minim, yes, um, played pianissimo, tied to a ha uh, another minim under the, chroma uh, under the chromatic vocal line. In actual performance, such a softly articulated single note will fade long before the fourth beat over which it is held, thus making it essentially absent to the listener. This is even more so in the case of the last four measures of the work, if you look there, where the E above middle C is sounded più pianissimo in the piano, and marked as sustained for seven beats, while the vocal line chants the last line of text. This sustained E natural anchors the tonal setter of the end of the song, and yet in actual practice, once again, it is inaudible long before the score indicates a release of the tone, once again rendering the pitch both present and absent. The listener is drawn into this musical experience of directionless movement, which echoes at a structural level the movement implied in Mallarmé's poem, as I've said, from rest to horizontal agitating of the fan and back to rest. While at first this structure might seem to mirror structures of exposition, development, and recapitulation, there is no development to speak of in the poem. By abandoning functional tonality, Debussy cancels harmonic development but retains some sense of small, nearly imperceptible movement in the shift from F sharp to E. The song does not return us to an original home tonality, nor does it give us a strong sense of E major or minor as a harmonic arrival point in the final phrases. Cadential movement, like so many other elements, musical elements here, is suggested without actually appearing in the last nine measures, 
which feature movement in the bass from B to E, measures 58, 59. Once again at the end of the song, an E is sounded, but this time without a preceding dominant. The D sharp in the final chord also serves to weaken the sense of arrival to the, sen to the key of E minor, resulting once again in an impression of simultaneous presence and absence. Far from merely evoking a tonality without fully developing it, Debussy invites the listener to a much more subtle way of perceiving the piece, involving a listening practice that parallels the kind of reading necessary to grasp a poem by Mallarmé. In the case of the latter, one needs sometimes, as I've said, to read backwards as well as forwards, to take time to puzzle out the syntax, to identify the ways in which various semantic and acoustic systems interact or exist at odds with each other, to be particularly attentive to subtleties of meaning, even down to the etymolo etymological level, that remain tacit and inaccessible at first, at a first casual reading of the poem. To conclude then, abandoning a traditional notion of progression uh, for one of gesture, Debussy goes far beyond an evocation or illustration of the words of Mallarmé's text in order to represent a similar kind of experience of reading or listening, one that immediately invites a rereading or second listening. When Debussy and Mallarmé are at their most intimate, in a poem representing a simple movement of a domestic object and a melodie with a hushed vocal line and often sparse piano accompaniment, they could also be said to, approaching, to be approaching their most metaphysical concerns, since the emphasis on the silence of the presque rien, that almost nothing, calls into question music and poetry's power to transform the ineffable. By their process of subtraction, Debussy and Mallarmé allow us to rethink musical and poetic expression, so to speak, that does not cancel direct address, but rather reshapes it as an invitation to pay heightened attention to details and the way that they provide potentially hidden sources of meaning. The miniature world, world of the song gestures toward an opening up of the domestic into the metaphysical, of silence into sound and back. Thank you. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.